Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. This is really happening. Like, I'm testifying against my dad, my own dad. Yeah. My sister, she wrote a, a witness statement saying that she remembered my dad getting in and out of the bed with me over the years when we, I was sharing a room with her. And she said that she always kind of felt kind of hurt because she thought my dad like loved me more, cared about me more because he would get in bed with me, but not with hers. Yeah. And, and my mom said that my sister had shared a, a room with me growing up and she was like, did you abuse my other little girl? And... She said my dad's demeanor kind of changed and his face kind of got this disgusted look on it. And he was like, no, no, I was never attracted to her. She was too chubby. Oh my gosh. And my mom was like, well, lucky for her. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can join in on the conversation. Liking, subscribing really helps the channel grow, reach more people, helps us bring more awareness to these cults, these groups, and also platform the stories of the survivors who are willing to come on and share their stories with you. So if you want to support them, don't forget to leave those words of encouragement down below. So today's guest, you may have seen the article that has been covered in a lot of the ex-Mormon spaces. We've done a live on it with Colby Reddish, who kind of broke down some of the law around this, and it is a Mormon story. So the mainstream Mormon church, the same church that I grew up in, we're going to be talking about ways in which they mishandle abuse cases, specifically CSA. And we're actually going to do two parts with her because there's a lot to cover. So in this first part, you're really going to be getting an insight into her life, her childhood, the ways in which the church played a role. And then in the second part, we're going to be diving into the the legalities, how the church was essentially protecting the abuser and their own reputation over the victim, over the survivor. We're going to bring on her mom for that. So thank you so much for joining us, Chelsea Goodrich. Hi, Shalise. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. I'm so happy that you are willing to come on and speak about this. I know it's been a lot for you, a whirlwind. Everyone wants to talk to you. Your story is one that just makes everyone's jaw drop and want to know more. And so I just really appreciate you being willing to come on and share because I know it can be a lot emotionally. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to share. Yeah. So, okay, mainstream Mormonism. We've talked about extreme Mormonism on this channel before. We've been covering mainstream Mormonism for the past couple weeks on the channel because it has been in the news a lot lately. So, Chelsea's story was featured in an AP article, and we will definitely link that in the comments, in a pinned comment, so you can reference that if you'd like. And you uh, just interviewed with Mormon Stories, which will probably be coming out around the same time this comes out. So there's a lot to cover. Um, I guess where we'll start is just giving an idea about Mormon culture, how you grew up, kind of the rules that you lived with, and who your dad was. So do you want to kind of give us a brief overview of your childhood in that sense? Yeah, I will. And I, I want to start by, I guess, addressing a couple of questions that I've gotten a lot from those that don't know the story, which is, why did I come out now with this story? And did I violate a non-disclosure with the church in this process? The answer to that, to both of those questions is kind of answered in one explanation, which is that I found out the end of last year, beginning of this year, that my dad, my abuser, that he had gotten himself involved in my sister's ongoing divorce case and he was battling to have access to his grandkids. And that's my niece and nephews. And uh, my brother-in-law reached out and he said, would you testify uh, in the divorce case for the protection of these kids? Would you testify to what you know about your dad and why he's not safe mm -hmm. uh, to be around these kids? And I said, well, of course I will. And 
because that was done legally through a subpoena. I was subpoenaed to be deposed in this divorce case as a witness. That allowed me to, I was required to turn over all the documentation, all the recordings from all these past legal cases and everything to do with my dad and the church. So uh, I turned that all over and that essentially made all of that information become public access, mm. become accessible to a lot of people. And I think that's how the AP, the Associated Press, ultimately got all of that information, not through me. So I didn't violate uh, any you know, non-disclosure with the church or with my dad because I also had sued my dad through this process. And, uh, and also I didn't reach out to the AP myself. Somebody else did. I don't know. Somebody who along this way, some, some friends have come to know my story. So somebody anonymously reached out to them and said, there's all this documentation. And then the AP reached out to me and said, would you be willing to share? And at this point I'm thinking, well, you know, the church and the legal system, nobody else is doing anything to get the truth out there about the danger that my dad is to children. So it is time for me to say something so I can protect my niece and nephews. And so I can protect any other children involved because unfortunately my dad is still a practicing dentist in the state of Idaho. And he has, you know, patients that are also children, I'm sure, because he has no restrictions currently on his license. So mm -hmm. just so many children at risk. And I thought nobody else is going to speak up about this. So I am. And fortunately, because of the divorce trial, I have been able to uh, get all that documentation out there legally without violating my NDA, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. And it's amazing that you're willing to platform yourself because it is really tricky. And we'll talk about more of all of the the things that have to do with the emotional side in a little bit. So are we good there? Should we move on to your childhood? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So your dad was actually a bishop. And mm -hmm. Maybe I'll have you explain because I've done the explaining. Usually I'm the Mormon explainer. So if you want to tell everybody who's not familiar with Mormonism what being a bishop means, also through your perspective as a child, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my dad got called to be a bishop when I was, I believe, 13 years old. And uh, previous to that, you know, our family had been very active, faithful Mormons. Both of my parents served missions for the LDS church, you know, full-time uh, service missions for the church when they were younger in their early twenties. And my dad went to North Carolina. My mom went to Canada. Uh, they returned from their missions, met each other through, you know, church stuff. And then they had me and by two and a half, I actually was showing some weird behaviors that made my mom take me to a therapist and I was diagnosed at age two and a half as having been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. And the therapist talked to both of my parents about it. She said, this girl's definitely been sexually abused. Do you have any idea who it was? And, you know, um, my mom was like horrified and my dad, she, my mom says in hindsight, she can see that he wasn't as maybe shocked or disturbed as he should have been. Mm -hmm. um, but he of course said, Oh, you know, I, I don't know. And, uh, and it really didn't occur to my mom that it could be my dad. And then uh, years went on and uh, there were, in hindsight, a lot of signs and symptoms that are classic symptoms of child sexual abuse that I was exhibiting as I grew up. My mom just, you know, she had no idea that, and she actually was very protective of us. Uh, we were, you know, very faithful within the church. And she didn't really want us like spending time at friends' houses too much or spending the night and things like that. She was so protective because she was afraid of me getting abused again because she knew that someone had abused me uh, when I was younger, but she didn't know it was my dad. So ironically, my mom was super protective of us to try to prevent us from getting sexually abused. But little did she know that uh, the abuser was right under our own roof, you know, mm. and doing things in the middle of the night to, to me. And so I'm 13 years old and my dad gets called to be the bishop. That's such a big deal. Uh, the bishop is, uh, considered a really important leader 
within the Mormon church over the church congregation. He's, you know, the father of the ward. I think there's like some church song about that. Um, he's the leader of the ward, kind of like a priest, I guess, uh, in other churches or a pastor in other churches. Very important. Something I'll mention too, is that when I was nine years old, my dad did come to me and take me aside privately. And he started sobbing and he said, I have to tell you something when you and I have played in the swimming pool together, because our family at that time had an indoor swimming pool. He said, I've been doing bad things to you. I've been having bad thoughts and, and touching you badly. And I'm so sorry. I've repented. And I'd never seen my dad crying like that before. I was like shocked. And he said, I'm so sorry. I'm so upset, but I've repented and I don't want you to tell mom because then, you know, she will be upset. And he said, so this is between you and me. And, um, I think that we need to be more careful when we're playing in the pool together. That we need to be more careful. Yeah. We need to be more careful. So this kind of thing doesn't keep happening. And honestly, I had no idea what he was talking about. Now in hindsight, I can see totally how he was molesting me and, and using that physical, super physical playtime as an opportunity to be very, um, you know, to be fondling, to, to, he would do this game that was like, oh, you ride on my back and then I ride on your back. And I remember even as a kid thinking, well, it makes sense for me to ride on dad's back because he's the dad, he's big. But why does, why would he ride on my back? Like that's an awkward experience, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's all really clear now, but at the time I didn't understand things about, you know, sexual stuff. And so, uh, I just remember thinking, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be being careful about. And I don't know what my responsibility is here. So I think I'm just not going to play with that in the pool anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I'm just going to avoid the whole situation. And so I did, but, uh, for years after that, what he did was he would come and get in the bed with me in the middle of the night um, while he was aroused and I would feel his erect penis on my backside <sighs> and uh, he would be like massaging my shoulders and back and uh, I was uncomfortable and I, I would, I was super stiff, like physically, I just remember being kind of stiff and kind of trying to, to pull away and resist. And he would say, oh, you don't you don't love your daddy. You don't like me, do you? And so I felt I was shamed, you know, I felt yeah. ashamed and I felt guilty. And I thought it was, I thought, I don't like this, but it's clearly my problem because since my dad had come to me at age nine, uh, about the swimming, swimming pool stuff and said he was sorry and everything. I thought, well, whatever he's doing now, even though I don't like it, it must not be bad because when he was doing bad things, he apologized for that and he stopped, I guess. Yeah. So I guess this is okay, even though it feels kind of gross, you know, mm -hmm. it was just so confusing. After he was called to be bishop, the abuse continued. It actually escalated to where there was an incident that was particularly severe. It happened at a hotel room uh, back east on a field trip that uh, my dad came as a chaperone for, ironically. My brother was my brother and I were joining this school group for this charter school that we were attending at the time, like through long distance, because we were actually being homeschooled by then. Um, my brother and I were both struggling in certain ways uh, when we had been in school, which now we look back and realize was because of, of, you know, abuse. There was abuse symptoms and we were struggling because of abuse, but um, my mom didn't know that. So she's like, well, you know, maybe they will do better if I homeschool. Um, even though she was really kind of scared to do that and overwhelmed by it, she just was trying to do what was best for us. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, from about age eight or so, eight or nine, um, I was being homeschooled. And eventually when I got a little older, we were doing this like um, long distance uh, charter school thing where they would send the VHS videotapes and we would watch them and do the assignments and send the assignments back to the school in Utah. So anyways, the school went back East on a field trip at a hotel there where my mom wasn't present. Cause, um, ironically she had not gone on the trip because she was on bed rest to avert a, a miscarriage, mm. um, from a pregnancy at that time. So it was just my dad that went with us. 
And yeah, he, things were worse than ever in this hotel room incident when he got in the bed with me. And the next day I confronted him for the first time about it. I was like pretty upset. I don't remember all the details of what I said, but I know I was upset and it was like, why, what were you doing? Like what, that was so like awful. And what were you doing in my bed? And why are you doing that to me? And he was like, oh, I just wanted to snuggle you and cuddle you and something like that. Like he just was like minimizing it again. Yeah. I think that he started to realize that I was getting a little older and he was maybe worried that I was going to start putting the pieces together or that I was going to say something to my mom or something. And so uh, that was the last time that there was like a severe incident like that um, clear up into my adult years. I understand now uh, from things that he's admitted and from, you know, putting the pieces together of my own experiences that he was continuing to like molest me essentially and be uh, pervy <laughs> pretty much every time that he was showing me any kind of what I thought was just regular affection. He was apparently almost always aroused and often getting erections when he was just like giving me a hug or mm. um, just around me from, from what he's admitted to. So that's obviously been weird to think about and hard to process too over the years. But um, yeah. So as a teenager in, in, in the year 2000, when my dad was still a Bishop, I think like that the next year after uh, that, the, the sexual assault that happened on, on the East Coast, that it was like the next year in the Mormons World Worldwide Conference. It's called General Conference. They have it twice a year. And all of the apostles and the Mormon prophet speak. Yeah, in fall of 2000, one of the 12 apostles that our family knew, because when my parents lived in Salt Lake City, Utah, they had been in the same congregation with this apostle and they got to know he and his wife. And actually his wife was my mom's little teaching companion for a while. Mm. And, and she even babysat me like um, at the apostle's home. <laughs> that was an interesting connection, but this apostle in 2000, he spoke in the worldwide conference and he talked about our family and he actually held us up as kind of like a standard for the rest of the Mormon world and wow. like a model family for everyone to follow. I think, you know, that obviously that was a really big deal. And I think it made the Mormons that we knew think that we were like pretty much perfect and that my dad was, you know, pretty much perfect. Definitely had so much trust in him, even more trust than ever because of that in him as a Mormon bishop and a leader and a lot of trust, you know, that people had, I think with him spending time with their kids, even alone in his office, because bishops do a lot of interviews and things mm -hmm. alone with kids in their offices. I think that nowadays the church has changed some policies related to that because there's been problems and issues with that. But yeah, that's more recent. I mean, back then, there was, he had a lot of, you know, just total trust from people um, letting their kids be alone with him. Do you remember the way that you felt when that came out in general conference? Do you remember having a thought of, do all dads act this way or that's not true? Why would they say that? Do you remember reacting? Yeah, I think I was pretty clueless at the time as a kid because that stuff with my dad, since he had done a really good job when I was younger, you know, when I was like nine or whatever, telling me, you know, don't tell mom and telling me that this was between he and I mm -hmm. and also that there was really nothing wrong now with, with him getting in the bed with me. I felt uncomfortable, like I said, but I didn't really, I didn't realize that it was what it was, <laughs> that it was like sexual abuse. I think that I just compartmentalized a lot of things growing up, like I separated that stuff out from everything else that was going on in my life, didn't connect it. So I think when 
the apostle talked about our family. I do remember thinking that our family was like a good example to people, but I remember thinking that that was more because of my mom, Hmm. because I felt like she was the one that really cared a lot about serving other people and doing missionary work. And our family did do a lot of like, you know, handing out books of Mormon to the neighbors and to our friends who weren't Mormon. And at the time, I thought that that was like, so amazing that we did that. And so important because I believed at the time that, you know, we belonged to the only true church, to Christ's true church. And so the most important work we could do was bringing other people into Christ's church. My mom was always trying to help us do that as kids, like with our friends and our neighbors. So yeah, I think when that came out, I thought, yeah, we are a model family. It's mostly because of like my mom being so amazing. But I did remember thinking, you know, a lot if people knew how my dad acted at home and treated us and talked to us compared to how he talks to and treats other people, that people would be surprised. So I do remember thinking a little bit about that. But um, as far as the sexual abuse, I just, it was so uncomfortable to me that I think I mostly just didn't I didn't think about it. Yeah. And this was going on almost consistently because you'd mentioned to me off camera that it wasn't just once or twice that he got into your bed. It was very frequent. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine that it just seemed like that was part of life, even though you didn't feel comfortable with it. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. You said that very well. I had been groomed, you know, as they say, pedophiles do to be very used to my dad coming and getting in the bed with me. He did it like once a month, I would say over the period of, I don't know, five years or so, four or five years up until I was about 14. And so, yeah, I, it had become somewhat normalized, even though I didn't like it every time he had groomed me to tolerate it instead of resist it. So I never liked it, but I tolerated it. Yeah. And I had been trained to do so. Wow. I'm so sorry that you went through all of that. It's obviously not okay. And I know that you know that it's just so hard to look back at a past like that and kind of unravel it and and figure out what was going on. And I haven't really talked about it a lot on the channel. Maybe once in another video that's like an older video and I won't go too much into it because this is your episode not mine but I feel like talking to you and hearing your story it's like looking in the mirror same thing happened to me with my dad and abuse from infancy to eight years old and a lot of it was blocked memories and things that I didn't really understand until it all came together I got the memories back things were admitted, and it's just a lot to process. And I'm just really sorry that you had to go through that, and especially the way that the church has handled it since you've tried to come out and seek justice for what you went through. I think what I want to bring up next is the fact that he did self-report during his bishop uh, term to a stake president. And if you're not familiar, stake presidency is just one step higher than the bishop as far as authority goes in the hierarchy. So do you want to talk about how you came to understand that he did confess at some point? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say, Chalice, that I'm so sorry that you had to go through something like this too. And as we've been talking, of course, it's tragic and completely messed up that either of us had to go through this. But since we did, um, it has felt validating and it's felt like being seen in a really unique way to talk to you mm-hmm. Same. and for us to understand each other. Yeah. In, in that way. So if there's any silver lining at all um, to all of this, it would be. It would be making a new friend that really understands. Yeah. <laughs> and vice versa. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, so fast forward, I mean, 
there was a lot of things that I look back now in my teenage years where I was struggling. And uh, now I realize that, that I didn't have like a normal um, ability to date really, or to connect with guys. And I felt really extreme panic um, and anxiety and depression around dating, especially when anything would start to get more serious. Uh, because I think that there was just this fear of if I got in a sexual relationship with a man that I would feel forced to do things against my will, that I would feel trapped. And so I think that because I was such a devout Mormon girl, I went on a mission to Korea for 20 months and wow. was very devoted. And I think that, you know, for me to be able to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to have sex till I get married. I'm, you know, I'm going to stay really pure. I'm going to, for a while, I actually had a goal of like first kiss over the marriage altar. Mm. Yeah. Because one of the prophets had said that was like a worthy goal. So anything that was like related to chastity, purity goals, I would like go to the extreme of that, you know? Um, and I think that that, that did feel and I, you know, I respect those that, that want to do that kind of thing. I think that, you know, that's, that's great. If, if someone wants to do that coming from the right place. And I think that my intentions were good, but I can see now that that was also something that I was, it was a protective thing. You know, it was like something that I was kind of trying to hide behind as well to an extent, um, because of those deep fears of intimacy that had been created from my abuse. It was so bad that there was one time that uh, I was dating someone that I was very in love with. He loved me. He was a wonderful guy. And I wanted to be with him so bad. But as our relationship progressed and he started to want to get more serious and he was talking about getting engaged and married, right away it triggered like extreme panic attacks and a migraine so severe that it was like one of those migraines where you go blind, like a complicated migraine where it just took out my vision and I had to go to the emergency room and my doctors had me not driving for a while. And I remember this guy saying, I feel so bad. I feel like this is my fault because, you know, anytime I just want to have these conversations, the next thing I know, you're like having to go to the emergency room because you're so sick. And I'm like, ah, you know, I was like, it's not your fault. I felt like it was just, I was just messed up. There was something wrong with me. I didn't understand yet at that point. So the years went on and there were flashbacks and nightmares and things that were really weird to me. You know, that didn't make any sense based off of my dating experiences. I hadn't been sexually experienced or active. And so having flashbacks or nightmares related to like being sexually assaulted from behind, I just thought that was so strange and couldn't really place it. And then when I was in my late twenties, I was going to graduate school in the Los Angeles area in Southern California. And I was learning more about the subconscious mind and how it works and how it often brings forward things in the form of symptoms or signs or symbols that we need to pay attention to because it's often trying to tell us something that we've repressed or that we need to know <laughs> that we aren't aware of consciously. So mm -hmm. uh, that caused me to start to pay closer attention to, you know, just these things in my life, like why I couldn't have a close intimate relationship, why I would get so sick related to that, why I was having these weird flashbacks that kind of felt discombobulated and disconnected but I could tell that they were coming from something real that it seemed like was really traumatic to my brain and my body that were being replayed in like a I explained this to you the other day Shalise but it's like a somatic uh PTSD flashback where you physically feel all of the sensations 
in your body that you felt while you were being abused. Mm -hmm. You feel that all over again as if it's happening again in real time. And it's just wild when it's happening. And I mean, particularly for me in the middle of the night, if I roll over to my side, just a normal sleeping position. But for me, that is a very triggering um, time and place and position where I can immediately have these things come up for me in the form of a flashback or waking up from a dream. I'll think I'm currently being sexually assaulted again. Um, So it's caused a lot of sleep issues over the years. Even currently I have to try to manage and work through that. So anyways, I'm in my late twenties. I'm trying to piece together these things. And I start thinking about some of my childhood memories, including those with my dad and going, oh, wait a minute. (laughs) I think that I might be finding the answers here. And so around the same time, I had two younger siblings who were getting married and they had both gone on missions and they were getting married in the temple to, um, other LDS return missionaries they were engaged to. And uh, my family decided to do like a double wedding reception in Mountain Home, Idaho, my hometown, for my two siblings and their new spouses. And so we were preparing for the reception. And my mom, as usual, was trying really hard to keep costs down and do everything on the cheap, even though, frankly, my parents had plenty of money, but my dad was very controlling with the money. He would always refer to it as his money. It wasn't like my parents' money. He'd say, my money, it's my money. So um, we were trying to keep costs down because he was, um, you know, kind of throwing these fits about that he didn't want to spend too much money on the wedding stuff. And so, yeah, we were, my mom and I were working on my sister's wedding dress at one point, it was actually like a wedding dress that we'd gotten on one of those, like, um, is it called like twinkle.com? I don't know. One of those like sites out of China where you can get these really mm -hmm. like, I've done it before (laughs) um, for like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was a teenager. Uh Uh-huh. And my sister found actually her dream wedding dress on there. Uh, and we're like, oh, well, you know, we'll see the quality of it when it gets here. But we ended up ordering like two or three of them to have extra fabric to make altercations and stuff, which was easy because I think each dress was only like 20 or 30 bucks or something. It was wild. But my mom, yeah, this is all to save money. So my mom and I are like, you know, (laughs) trying to piece together this um, wedding dress out of these multiple wedding dresses off of a cheap site online. Anyways, while I'm talking to my mom, we were talking about how my dad, he had just been in the room a minute before, I think kind of yelling about the money stuff again. And we're like, we're doing everything we can. And he walked out and my mom's like, oh, he's he's so frustrating. And I said, yeah, dad can definitely be, you know, kind of a jerk, pretty ornery. Um, But I said, you know, my worst memories of him though, I've realized recently are like the creepy ones of him, of like creepy stuff that he did to me and she's like what do you mean and so I just started to tell her like you know everything that I kind of just told you explained here and what those memories were and him coming to talk to me about stuff in the swimming pool him coming to get in the bed with me regularly for years when I was growing up and I still remember my mom like kind of dropping you know her stuff on the sewing machine and she was like flushed red. She's like, Oh my gosh, what? Okay. She's asking me more questions and I'm explaining. And she's like, Oh, this is not, this is not sound good. Cause I think, you know, from what I was describing to her, she knowing my dad's sexual approach, you know, as his wife, that he tended to come from behind and that kind of stuff as a preference that she was just listening to me and going, there's no way that this is innocent this is not sounding right. And she told me that she felt from that moment on that her life was never going to be the same, that she was going to have to make some major changes in her situation. Yeah. So she was like, okay, um, 
this is like the worst news that I could ever get. She was like, but, um, we have this double wedding reception, you know, coming right up. And she was like, let's just try to get through that for the sake of the kids. And as soon as that's over, I'm going to confront your dad about this. And I was needing to head back to Los Angeles and I said, okay, I'm coming home again soon and I'll talk to him too when I when I get back. Oh my gosh, this is literally exactly what happened to me. Like there was, <sighs> is... my brother was getting married. I knew about it. I told my mom and it was like, we're going to get through the wedding first and then we're going to talk to your dad. I swear, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, that that's just so strange. <laughs> so I I totally understand the feelings and it's the same thing. I had to like fly in to talk to him. Wow. Okay. So uh, well, I'm sorry to make you have to relive. No, it's it's okay. <laughs> no, it's it's fine. And I've I kind of decided today. I'm like, okay, am I gonna talk about this publicly? Um, but I think it's the right time as far as just also validating your experience and showing that I really truly understand where you're coming from. So no need to apologize. Um, okay, yeah. so then well, thank you. How, how did that go when you ended up confronting him? Or do you want to talk about that? Yeah, definitely. And you're very brave, Shalise, to do that. Because no matter what, I mean, I know you get this. I know a lot of other people out there get this. The reason that we usually talk about these things is for other people. Because it's never comfortable to talk about this stuff, especially like in a public forum. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it feels so, we feel so exposed in a way that's just kind of horrifying. Like that's how I felt the last week or something. Mm -hmm. Cause I thought, you know, this is literally horrible. Like I hate it, but also I'm doing it for a bigger cause and purpose. And for ultimately I hope protecting children and, and, and getting some other people to hopefully protect children better too, or try to like in the churches or in the, you know, legal system. I don't know. I don't know. But I think yeah. enough of us come together with our stories. Those of us that have been abused that maybe, um, maybe collectively we can make a difference. Yeah, I agree. So my mom, she confronted my dad and because he was in that initial confrontation, so caught off guard he initially was truthful. Like he initially told the truth and I think was the most honest that he ever was in that first confrontation because he wasn't expecting it. He was totally caught off guard, didn't really have time to lie, make up lies. And, um, and my mom wasn't recording yet, which we wish she wishes that she had been. We started recording after that first conversation, but that first one was the most, he was the most forthcoming. Hmm. And so um, she asked him, she was like, did you go and get into that little girl's bed, referring to me, dozens and dozens of time over the years while she was growing up in order to sexually gratify yourself? And did you do that? Did you sexually gratify yourself on her? And he was like, yes, yes. She said he kind of started breathing heavy, um, was getting uh, anxious. And he goes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I did. I did everything she told you. It, it is the truth, but I repented of it. I, I went and talked to the stake president while I was a bishop and I took care of that. I really did. It's all behind us now. It's all behind us now. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that it's behind you, but <laughs> all of us are going not so much. Yeah. And, and my mom said that she's like, oh, hoo -hoo, this is not behind us. And she asked him in that same conversation. She wasn't even thinking about like really my, if my brothers had gotten, could have gotten abused at the time, but she knew about my sister, that my sister had shared a, a room with me growing up. And she was like, did you abuse my other little girl? And she said, my dad's demeanor kind of changed and his face kind of got this disgusted look on it. And he was like, no, no, I was never attracted to her. She was too chubby. And my mom was like, well, lucky for her. Wow. Um, my mom was like overwhelmed. And she's like, I, I don't even know what to do right now. I need time to process this. And around that same time, some relatives were coming through town. They stopped by and they could see that my mom was really distraught. 
And they were like, what's going on? And so she started to tell them, you know, this is what's happening. I don't know what to do. And um, they talked to my dad around that time and he admitted some things to them, but um, he was already kind of starting to pull back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they did write a witness statement, though, um, at some point when the criminal trial came up later, um, saying that in that conversation with him, that he, he did seem really distraught and upset, like he was guilty, and that he told them that, you know, when he was, uh, when he had been a bishop years before, because he wasn't a bishop now, but he, well, although in the church, they say once a bishop, always a bishop. It's kind of a funny thing. Even after they like release them from the official calling, the official responsibility, they're considered, people will still refer to them as bishop and like see them with that um, authority. The highest of, so. name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he had told the relatives though, that when he was a bishop, that he had gone sometimes to visit this man in prison who was in there for raping his stepdaughter. And the guy was Mormon. And I guess, you know, under my dad's um, jurisdiction. And so he would go visit this guy in prison. And, and my dad told the relatives in this conversation in 2015, well, I'm just so scared, you know, if I go to the police, because, you know, I always felt like that guy that raped his stepdaughter got too harsh of a punishment. And he said, I feel like what I did was even worse than him. Oh. So who knows what, you know, who knows what sentencing I might get. The relatives were like, well, you really, you really still should go turn yourself into the police. We can escort you. And he was like, no, I've been suicidal. I would rather kill myself and all this stuff. And they were like, okay, well, um, at some point somebody suggested going to the bishop. I, I can't remember if that was them or him, but somebody said something about that. And he was like, yeah, I, that's a good start. I would rather just go to the bishop first. They escorted him over, made sure he got over to the bishop's house that night to Bishop Miller was the bishop's name at, at the time. And he did make a confession um, that was severe enough that, you know, the bishop was like, whoa, I think this is going to be next communication. And Bishop Miller called me while I was in Los Angeles and we talked over the phone. And at that time, Bishop Miller, he didn't realize that I didn't remember everything that my dad had confessed to him. If that makes sense. And so he started, Bishop Miller started saying things to me that um, I didn't know, like fully know about. And so then I think when he realized that I didn't remember everything that my dad had told him, he kind of started to go, oh, I guess I should be careful what I'm saying here because I just assumed that you remembered everything that your dad confessed, but it sounds like you don't. So I'll be careful what I say. But before it reached that point that he realized that he told me some things that kind of helped fill in some of the gaps for me of my abuse. Yeah. And what he said was that um, in that hotel incident that happened back East, that um, he said, you know, your dad told me that that got that particular incident, things got really out of hand your dad said that he was afraid that something bad was going to happen to you. And the bishop said, I was under the impression that maybe he was afraid that you could have gotten pregnant from that incident. And he said, honestly, Chelsea, if you do have flashbacks or nightmares of being sexually assaulted from behind, he said, just know there's very good reason for that based off of what your dad confessed to me. Mm. So, I mean, that was, that was like horrible to hear, but at the same time it was validating, you know, because yeah, it, it filled in the, the missing pieces that I hadn't been able to figure out all these years of these memories and flashbacks. And the bishop at that point had a natural instinct to do the right thing. And he said, you know, um, if you do end up, if this ends up going into a criminal court, 
He said, I hope that I get subpoenaed as a witness. So he said, boy, will I talk. Those were his exact words. He said, boy, will I talk. He said, because what your dad confessed to me, I want to be able to speak about it and say what it was so that people can protect their children from your dad. It was like the world needs to know. The stake president who in the Mormon world, the stake president is an authority over the bishops. And the stake is like um, a group of congregations called wards that are, you know, usually within a particular area like county. And the stake president is over all of the congregations, which are called wards. And uh, so he, he's over the bishops. At some point, you know, the bishop obviously told my dad, you should, you need to talk to the stake president as well about this stuff. But by the time my dad went to the stake president, he changed his story. I mean, I think he still confessed to some things, but now he was focusing on blaming my mom and me. Uh. And he was saying, you know, my wife is mentally ill and she just got my, my daughter to, to say this stuff, to lie for her benefit. So unfortunately, the stake president, we were trying to talk to him and he didn't really want to talk to us. Like, um, you know, my dad had been a long time friend of his and a dental patient. They had served together in previous church callings. The stake president probably wanted to believe my dad's story and he mm -hmm. probably didn't want to hear ours because he was preferring that my dad's story was the truth because that was easier to hear. And also because then he wouldn't have to deal with excommunicating my dad and all of that and, and, and having the church look bad to this small community that we lived in. And yeah, the state president, oh, he, he wouldn't talk to us. He was very cold. And then finally the bishop almost kind of forced him to meet with us. Bishop Miller was like, you've got to talk to these women. Like, why won't you talk to them? And so we had this meeting with him and, and he didn't want to, I still remember the state president being like, I don't have time. I've, I've got to go to another meeting in two minutes. And the bishop was like, can you just talk to them for a minute? You know, the state president sat there and he was just emotionless and expressionless. And he just stared at us and he was like, well, referring to my dad, he goes, well, did he ejaculate? Okay. As if that makes any sort of difference. Right. So I guess, I don't know, but I guess he was indicating that that was like the line <sighs> over which if there hadn't been ejaculation, then then it's fine. There wouldn't be excommunication. Yeah. And he said to my mom, and have you even been like sharing a bed with your husband over these years? Do you even share a bed with him anymore? Mom's like, well, yeah, but I mean, like, Sometimes, you know, my husband is a real night owl. So sometimes if I know he's going to be coming into bed late, I might go to another bed so he won't come and wake me up. But like here she is having to explain herself. That's not relevant. About this. It's not relevant. Like what? So if he wasn't sharing, if she wasn't sharing a bed with. Then it's her fault. My dad over the years. then yeah, then that means that he had to go to his daughter for sex? No, 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 no. <sighs> oh, yeah, it was, I mean, we we couldn't even process it at the time. It was like, what's going on? And my mom was like, you know, I'm just concerned that he's still a danger. She says to the state president, she said, because, you know, he told us, John told us that he doesn't, trust himself to not still molest kids or even his own future grandkids. He wouldn't trust himself not to molest his own future grandkids. And the state president just kind of, again, like looked at us expressionless. And right then Bishop Miller speaks up and he goes, yeah, I mean, John told me that too. He told me the same thing. And then the state president turns to the bishop and he goes, oh, he told you that? And the bishop was like, yeah. And he goes, oh, okay, wow. Okay, this might be serious. Okay, call Salt Lake. I can't with this guy. Talk about the bias. But I will also say, after reading the transcripts of some of the recordings that you have of your dad and, like, the language, I'm like, he's 
exactly like my dad. And I know for a fact that he's extremely good at manipulating any situation that he's in to make himself look like the victim or look at me like I'm the one that's struggling and he can twist the story in any type of way, no matter who he's talking to and get them to believe him. So yes, the stake president's awful. And I also think equally your dad was probably a mastermind at crafting the story to make you look like the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think he was manipulating the stake president that way, but I think that the stake president obviously, uh, you know, <laughs> he had his own issues going on for why he would see and treat us that way. And I think that there is such a problem in society, and, and you know this, Chalice, but just it, it's real. Like for a long time, I didn't want to see it or think that it was real, but now I've been through too much that women really are often seen and treated so differently and so lesser mm -hmm. in these patriarchal type systems. Mm -hmm. As you know, <laughs> as you very well know. The stake president, because he was believing my dad, was kind of stalling and trying to avoid him getting excommunicated. But I think that eventually, it took like four months from the time that my dad confessed to Bishop Miller to the time he was excommunicated. That is shocking. Yeah. That is a shocking mm -hmm. amount of time. Yeah. When they knew what they knew. And I think eventually, you know, Bishop Miller got the stake president up to speed on what John had confessed to him. And also Bishop Miller had called the, the helpline, you know, the infamous uh -huh. helpline in Salt Lake City a number of times. They coached him on all kinds of stuff. They were like, well, Bishop Miller said, well, I think I should report, you know, should I make a report? And they were like, no, you don't need to do that because this woman's not a minor anymore. So, you know, you don't have to do anything legally. Oh my it's better that you don't. And they said, but, you know, they said, we will say that because this John Goodrich was a former Mormon bishop, because he has been a bishop, that you definitely need to excommunicate him. They basically recommended that an excommunication court happen, the actual court as more of a formality, because... Salt Lake City was ultimately mandating that he be excommunicated because, you know, they recognized that they told the bishop that because my dad had been a bishop for five years where he was, you know, actively serving in the calling, that there would have been so many children, of course, along with him. Yeah. And so Salt Lake City recognized that this is a huge liability. Um, if anything were to happen after this and they hadn't excommunicated him, then that part could be on them. So they mandated that he be excommunicated. Mm -hmm. uh, but it took so long because of the state president's, you know, kind of siding with my dad kind of thing. And according to policy, church policy, I, as the victim, am supposed to be allowed the opportunity to be there at the excommunication court. And the family is supposed to be notified as well. But that didn't happen. And that was a whole other fiasco where uh, the stake president, like my brother-in-law, called him to ask about what was going on with the excommunication because it had been scheduled and he didn't want to tell us. So we found out through the bishop. And then my sister and brother-in-law came up from Utah to attend the excommunication court with us. We went over to the church and nobody was there. The church was empty. Then we found out that they had canceled the excommunication court. And we're like, okay, why isn't, why won't the stake president communicate with us? Then eventually, you know, my dad was excommunicated, but we didn't know. And we actually only found out because my brother-in-law called, uh, Joe J. Christensen, who was, he's like a general area authority, like one of the higher up, um, church leaders and asked him what was going on. Joe J. Christensen looked it up in the system or however it works and was like, oh, it looks like he's been excommunicated. <laughs> and we're like, oh, good to know. Yeah. No one would tell us what was going on. And then uh, we found out later that the state president was also not announcing to the other church leaders that my dad had been excommunicated. He's basically just wanting to keep it like a big secret, you know, mm -hmm. because 
I wasn't allowed to be there at the excommunication court and my mom wasn't. And Bishop Miller wasn't even there, wasn't even made a part of it. My dad was allowed to just go hog wild with saying all kinds of things about that my mom was the abuser, that she severely beat us when we were growing up. What? And that he was innocent, but that my sister had written this letter it wasn't true because she wrote a, a witness statement saying that she remembered my dad getting in and out of the bed with me over the years when I was sharing a room with her. Mm-hmm. And she said that she always kind of felt kind of bad, kind of hurt because she thought my dad like loved me more, cared about me more because he would get in bed with me, but not with her. So, and she wrote this whole statement about my dad being abusive to her in other ways, mentally and emotionally which he was. And so my dad was able to say in this court, you know, my daughter lied and none of this is true. Oh blah, my blah, gosh. Blah. And it's supposed to be confidential. Like these excommunication courts are supposed to be totally private and secretive. But apparently one of the men and by the way, only men are on the excommunication courts, just for those who don't mm-hmm. know about these things. Uh, no women. It's always just men. And one of these men that were in the excommunication court for my dad apparently went home and said something to his wife about the excommunication court and what my dad had said. And, you know, just eventually leaked out through that into uh, gossip that spread everywhere that my mom was the abuser basically oh that was the gossip going around yeah the the mormon world and the town that um really my mom was crazy and the abuser but that she had pinned that all on my dad and that he was probably innocent i mean this was the kind of talk going around and i think that you know you think of the human nature of it for a lot of people who knew my dad as this incredibly like kind, seemingly spiritual man who was their bishop or who was their dentist or maybe both or who, you know, he had been Rotary Club president. He had been um, voted citizen of the year by the town, like at least once. There was a scholarship in his name over at the high school. He had honorary base privileges to go on and off the air force base, even though he wasn't military, just because that's how special he was. He had special privileges. Um, so, you know, this is how this man was viewed and he just, he had a lot of power, he had money, he had influence, he had connections. And my mom had just been this little stay at home mom all these years, you know, homemaker, homeschooling, kind of more of like a private person and people didn't really know her, know who she was as much. Uh, and she was the woman and she was, she didn't, she wasn't the one with a doctorate degree or she wasn't the, you know, church leadership, you know, she wasn't the bishop. She wasn't the man. She, she was just treated so badly through the process. And at some point she had started talking to a divorce attorney and she got separated from my dad shortly after we found out about found out about everything. And the divorce attorney told her, he was like, you need to get out of that town, my dear. He was like, he was like, I've been an attorney for a long time. I've seen a lot of things. And he was like, it is going to turn into hell for you. So that man is, he was like, your husband is the one who is the powerful one with status there. And he's the man. And he was like, you're this little wife, nobody to, in comparison to the way the world and your church sees things. So you need to get out of that town because it's going to get bad for you. And it really was getting bad. So um, my mom at the time was caregiving for my grandma, my 84 year old grandma full time caregiving her. And I had been living in LA, but I thought about staying in LA, but truthfully, my dad was supporting me in great part I was living like in a nice penthouse there in Santa Monica and I was going to school and my dad was, you know, really supporting me to a great extent. And I thought I can't take any 
more money from him, not a dime. Cause I thought, I don't want him to think that that's some kind of hush money. And that you owe him something. Yeah, exactly. That I owe him something or it's some kind of hush money in a way. And so I realized that I could stay there, but I would have to, everything would have to change. And I was going to have to drop out of grad school. And I thought, you know, my mom and grandma are really struggling. I'm struggling. We just need to stick together. So I decided to just move with them to Haley, which is where I live now, a little mountain town, about 90 minutes away from Mountain Home. And it's originally where my grandma was from too. So that was kind of a sweet connection within all of it. And I got a less, I got to spend a lot of time with my grandma and that kind of thing before she passed a few years later. So there were, um, there were good things about the move, but overall it was so, so, so hard for all of us to go through all of these changes and to have my dad turning what we thought was like our community and our friends before against us. And even eventually really tearing our family apart because he was, well, <laughs> that comes in later is that there's a, a criminal trial because I did turn my dad in. Um, it took me several months because my mom's divorce attorney kept saying, oh, you should wait until the divorce is over to turn him in. But uh, my mom and I reached a point where we were like, it didn't look like the divorce was going to be ending anytime soon because my dad was fighting so hard. You know, he didn't want the divorce to be on the grounds of his sexual abuse of me. He didn't want that to be like on the record, you know? It's exactly the same with my parents. Continue. Is it? <laughs> exactly <sighs> the same. <laughs> wow. That is yeah, so well. Is it's wild. not like I, I don't talk to very many people that have the same experience. So you yeah. get it. You get exactly yeah. what's. Our dads are probably, you know, it sounds like very similar in the way they operate. So, yeah, yeah. so that was um, a battle. And uh, because he was fighting so hard in the divorce, it didn't look like it was going to be over anytime soon. And in summer of 2016, when we were talking to my brother um, in a phone conversation that we recorded, because we started recording everybody and everything because we just didn't trust anyone anymore. Um, it was like, if we, yep, we did the same thing. Yeah. You understand if you don't record certain people, then it's like that conversation never happened later. <laughs> when you bring something yep. up, you're like, Oh, I never yep. said that. So, um, yeah, we were like, we were sarcastically called the recording Queens by certain people. <laughs> like, oh, the recording Queens. <laughs> like, they think that they have to record uh -huh. everything. It's like, well, yeah, we do. So, um, we were recording this conversation with my one of my brothers in summer of 2016, and he told us, he was like, you know, I've been talking to dad, and he was like, I just, I'm kind of concerned because he did tell me that he still gets boners every time he's around little kids. That was, you know, his, his wording for mm. it. He's getting erections. He was like, yeah, he's getting boners every time little kids come around. And... Around that same time, we had also been back to the mountain home house to get some of my mom's things. And we had seen that in the indoor swimming pool, there was suddenly all these like new kids floaty toys. <sighs> there hadn't been any kids floaty toys before that because all of us kids were now too old for that. But there was now like these little kids toys for the pool and little kids bathing suits. Mm. And he had like a new little cooler, refrigerator cooler with alcoholic drinks, but also like little kid juice box drinks, you know, and we're like, oh, he's having people with, you know, he's having people over to swim, but people with kids and he's having kids over to swim. And one of the neighbors had told us that some neighbor kids had been going over there to swim as well. So we talked to my brother around this time, as I was saying, and he says, yeah, dad's getting boners around little kids. And he told us, which lined up with what we had seen uh, you know, at the swimming pool, he said, and, you know, the divorce wasn't over yet, but he said, and dad has been dating, dating a lot, dating different women and dating women with young children. And we're like, oh, that lines up with what we saw at the swimming pool. So I think at that point, my mom and I were like, 
yeah, the divorce isn't over, but it doesn't matter. We need to go and report this guy because what we felt like is if we didn't report that whatever kids might get abused, you know, during that time before we reported that we would feel like it was partly on us in a way, because, uh, obviously, you know, the church wasn't going to report. And so if we didn't, more kids were going to get abused, we felt, and we just couldn't live with that, you know? Mm -hmm. And we felt like, well, whatever we do after we report, at least it won't be on us if kids get abused because the authorities know. So we went and made the report in September of 2016. And the police told us, well, um, it could take two or three months for us to investigate this and these things can take time. And we're like, oh yeah, we get it. And my mom's like, well, and maybe my divorce will be over, you know, in two or three months, hopefully, who knows? Well, <laughs> the police actually contacted us the next day, called us, uh, we were back in Haley and Detective Satterfield was the detective that called us and he was like, just so you know, we've, you know, detained and taken into custody and arrested John Goodrich. And we we're like, what? Whoa, that was really fast. And we're like, what's, whoa, that's crazy. And he said, yeah, we actually, after you ladies left the police station yesterday, we took a lot of time to listen to those recordings that you brought us of conversations that you had with him that you recorded. And he was like, after listening to those, we knew that we needed to act quickly. We felt that he is a, an eminent danger to the community, to, to the kids in the community, and that we needed to act quickly. And we're like, wow, well, that's, that's, that's good. That's probably good. And it was validating, you know, that they also saw that it was serious. Right. Unlike the church leaders who were like, oh, yeah, maybe let's just like wait a bit. Yeah. It's, it's interesting when you get into regular society outside of a cult and people respond appropriately and then you go, oh, is that what it was supposed to be like? Exactly. Yeah. They, they took our witness statement seriously. They took his statement seriously and acted appropriately. But here's something weird that we heard was that there's some kind of a law or statute or something or something, I guess, in Mountain Home. I don't know if it's in all the state of Idaho. I'm not really sure. I haven't looked into it, but there is some kind of law where if someone is a high profile citizen, considered a high profile citizen, then the police have to go and have the mayor sign off on an arrest warrant in order for them to arrest someone like before they can arrest them. Hmm. Uh, and that's what they had to do with my dad because he was considered a high profile citizen, I guess. Wow. Uh, the police actually had to get some kind of like a sign off from the mayor of Mountain Home to arrest him, which I think is very strange because I think, well, why should the mayor have to sign off on an arrest for someone like my dad, but not say like, you know, just some regular guy down the street? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just that just seemed like very strange, um, different, different standards, like, you know, different levels of accountability for someone to be held accountable. I don't know, just strange. But anyways, so arrested him and in their interview of him, he was obviously lying a lot at this point, but he actually admitted and said that he was having erections while playing with me in the swimming pool. So we went as far as admitting that. Okay. In the police interview. Um, you can see that in the police record. And he said, he talked a lot about like getting aroused around me, but he, he told the police, he was like, but I always knew where to draw the line. Jeez. I always knew where to draw the line. Anyways. So, yeah, then uh, the criminal trial is underway, or at least like the the case proceedings are underway. And I testified in the preliminary trial against my dad and testified about the abuse and my dad had hired one of the top 10, at least at the time, top 10 defense attorneys in the nation. Um, and this was a guy who had, I guess, at some point worked for the same law firm that defended the 9-11 terrorists back in the day. Yikes. He was, uh, yeah, he was expensive. But I would say the way things 
played out. He was probably worth the money. Uh, but yeah, he was, this guy was the defense attorney. He was doing his best to like, I don't know, trip me up and trick me into like saying something that would make it sound like I was contradicting myself or lying or whatever. But I felt really, um, it was so scary. I just remember being so scared going to testify. And my dad was sitting right there in front of me in the courtroom. And like at one point, you know, the prosecutor is like, do you know this man? You know, like how they start off. And I said, yes, I do. And she said, how do you know him? And I said, he is my father. And it was just so quiet for a minute in the courtroom. Like you could hear a pin drop. Like there was just such silence because there was you know, a lot of people there, but they knew what the charges were. And it just was so eerie and surreal, I think, for me and everyone there. That's like, oh, this is really happening. Like I'm testifying against my dad for my own dad, my own father for having sexually abused me. So, yeah. Um, but the, the testimony went well and the judge ruled for it to go to trial. The original prosecutor on the case, she was amazing. Tina Shinley. She had been a prosecutor, I think, for, I don't know, a decade or two. And she was very experienced. And she told me, she was like, I'm going to prosecute this man to the fullest extent of the law. I'm going to try to get him life in prison. And she said his criminal defense attorney has been calling me and I won't even take his calls because I'm not open to a plea deal in this situation. And of course, I was you know, glad to hear that. And she said, but I will warn you that the prisons are not full of poor pedophiles, but, mm. but they are full of poor pedophiles and they're not full of the, the wealthy ones. She's like the wealthy, well-connected. Yeah. She said the wealthy, well-connected ones are not really the ones that usually end up, you know, they, they usually get to go free because they are able to do that in our society a lot. So uh, she did get that little warning and she said, you know, I've seen that people like your dad will often bribe, blackmail, uh, harass, you know, buy off whatever people as much as they can in these situations. So she said, just be mindful of that. That He'll probably be trying to do that to your, your sister, your family members, anyone who's a witness or you know, has any kind of a witness statement. And that ended up being true. That ended up being accurate. And uh, my sister, so she was, She'd gone on a mission. She was married by this time and she had a baby on the way. And my dad dredged up some theft crime that she had from, I think like five years before or something when she was like 17 or 18, she'd stolen like some jewelry from an employer and that was wrong. And I remember before her mission, her saying something to me about that. And I said, well, you know, you can't just go talk to the bishop about that. You should go and take care of it with the people and make it right. And she said, okay, I'm going to do that. And she told me that she had, and I understood that she had taken care of the whole thing, but apparently she really hadn't, unfortunately. And so my dad was bringing this up to use as like blackmail against her. And, um, so yeah, he, she was living in Provo, Utah at the time, Utah. And he had contacted the police there and they were like calling her and she was terrified. And what she didn't know that we found out later, but she didn't know this sadly, is that the statute of limitations was, was up, was like long up on that crime that she committed. So it couldn't even have been prosecuted, you know, and um, she didn't know that. So I think my dad was telling her, he was like, I am going to get you in prison. I'm going to, you know, make sure you go to prison for this. So she was super scared. And at the same time, you know, she was, she and her husband, her new husband were living in a condo in Provo that my parents owned. And my dad actually told her he shut off her utilities. <gasps> and she was pregnant. Yep, she was pregnant. It was winter time. Wow. He shut off the utilities, the heat. And he said, I will turn your utilities back on if you will change your witness statement. Unbelievable. Actually, it's completely believable having heard the rest of the story, but disgusting. Yeah, so sad. And unfortunately, you know, I mean, all of that 
essentially did work to make my sister start to side with him more, turn against oh. me, my mom and me. But um, it's so sad because I know that that's not really what she wanted to do in her heart. And what she did was wrong. Like, I don't excuse it, but I also recognize, you know, that's just where she was at the time. And for her, like my therapist once told me, she was like, you know, most people go into survival mode when they're dealing with manipulators like this. They just go into survival mode. And I think there's something a little bit crazy <laughs> inside of me and inside of my mom that's a little different than that, where we're kind of more like, well, if we die, we die. Like we died doing the right thing. You know, it's almost kind of like, I guess you could look at it as being like good or brave or having integrity, but it's not for everybody because sometimes, honestly, it puts you in dangerous situations. And sometimes I do feel like I'm like, are we a little crazy that we're like this determined to stand up against the powerful mm -hmm. ones, you know? Yeah. Um, and maybe it is, but that's just how we are. <laughs> that's just how we are. So anyways, um, yeah. So then my sister was kind of turning on us. It was getting really discouraging. Uh, and I had reached out to the bishop around this time and was Bishop Miller and was like, you know, uh, can, you know, you said before that you wanted to testify. And he said something to the effect of like, well, you know, no, I, you know, I spoke to the Salt Lake City attorneys and that's, you know, I don't want to get sued. It's, it, and it's not a good idea for me to, to, to get involved with this. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like, wow. Um, I feel like everyone's like turning on, you know, <laughs> turning their back on me in this process. So yeah. something interesting during this time is that I had a friend from church in Los Angeles that I'd met at church in Los Angeles. She kept telling me, I told her a little bit about what was, what was going on. And she kept telling me, you know, you should talk to my dad because he works for the church. And she was like, I'm not sure all exactly what he does, but I know he like helps people in your situation. I think he helps people like you and you should talk to him. And she kept saying this to me for like a year. Finally, when this was all happening with, you know, the criminal trial and my sister and all of that, uh, I was like, okay, I, I need help here. And I need to understand why the bishop went from wanting to testify to not wanting to testify. And I need to know if my dad really did confess when I was a kid to another church leader or not, or who he told in the church. So anyways, I reached out to this guy named Paul Ridding, who's my friend's dad. And he happens to be the head of risk management at the church, which, you know, ended up being a very interesting, I guess, coincidence, if you will, uh, because I would never have reached out to the church or to like a church attorney if this hadn't happened, if this wasn't my friend's dad and she wasn't telling me to talk to him because I was still going to church. I was still faithful. It was not in my mind to sue the church. It just wasn't like a thing I was thinking of, but I was very upset and confused about the way things had been handled by the stake president and the church members back in Mountain Home. I wanted some answers. And so I emailed Paul Ridding. He emailed back. And I still have all of that email correspondence. And I was explaining to him everything that happened to us and what my dad said about confessing to at least one former priesthood leader when he was a bishop, when I was a kid. And I explained to him what had happened in Mountain Home and the state president and all of this stuff and other, other awful things that had happened with the church members. Anyways, and he, he wrote back and then he also called me and he was like, you know, uh, how about I fly from Salt Lake City to where you are there in Haley and we have a meeting and we talk about all this. And so I was like, okay. Um, so he flew out here and he met with uh, my mom and me. And then also Eric Alberti was there because 
in the church setting, they have something called home teachers. I think they call it something different now. I don't know. But at the time they called it a home teacher and it was basically like, and there's visiting teachers too, or there was, uh, that was the women that were assigned to like, come check on you and visit your house once a month, just to give like a little church lesson and say, hello, see how you're doing. And then the home teachers were, uh, the men version of that, that got assigned, you know, to come visit. And so Eric had been assigned to be one of our home teachers and, (laughs) you know, Eric was a convert to the Mormon church. He had previously grown up Catholic and, but I don't think he was like super devout in the Catholic church. He had been devout in the Mormon church in the sense that he too had been a Mormon bishop before and things like that. But I think that because of his life experiences and his his family not being Mormon and things like that, he just had a different perspective on things. And he also had recently watched the movie Spotlight. If any of you out there have seen it, or I don't know if you have Shalice, but uh, the movie Spotlight is so good. And it's all about the uncovering the spotlight that was done by the Boston Globe uh, in, in right. Boston by reporter Michael Resendez, who's who was the reporter on my story as well. They made a movie about him and uh, the uncovering that he did of the sexual abuse that was happening in the diocese there in the Catholic church in Boston area. And uh, so Eric had recently watched that movie spotlight and he was really uh moved by it and when we told him our story he was like man this kind of he was like this kind of reads almost like spotlight like the spotlight movie and the and the victims in there and so i think it, it just eric like had this different frame of mind when we were going to meet with paul ridding he's already thinking like hmm i wonder if the same thing that the catholic church did is happening in the Mormon church, you know? Right. And so, yeah, so that, that was amazing to have Eric there with us because he was a man, which, you know, is a big deal <laughs> in a patriarchal, um, religion and society. And, um, and he was very confident and forthright in the way he addressed Paul and the questions he asked him. He just kind of went right for the juggler in a way. What does the head of risk management of the LDS Church have to say about this case and why Bishop Miller cannot testify? I feel like that's a good place to stop. Yeah. Okay. We'll see you in part two. Okay. (laughs) So before we end, I still need to get a Linda Listen moment. So... I know it's like normally we end on like a lighter, happier note, but because the happiness part comes in part two, it feels a little off. Whatever you want to do, if you want to do like a sassy statement or inspiration for our viewers, it's up to you. Yeah, well, I think I'm going to write off that little comment I made earlier about my mom and me and kind of our approach to wanting to tell the truth and be honest and transparent to the point that maybe it seems a little crazy because of the risks we're taking. But I would just say to everyone out there, don't be afraid to be crazy when it comes to honesty, telling the truth, especially for the sake of protecting innocent children and other potential victims. So don't be afraid to be crazy when it comes to doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's beautiful. And I'm so excited to talk to your mom. She sounds like she would be best friends with my mom. They're very, very similar. And I can't wait to get her perspective on things as well. And guys, if you want to reach out to Chelsea here, her Instagram is at Resilient Wellness LLC. We'll put it in the description below so that you can contact her if you would like to. And do you have any other final thoughts on this episode before we wrap up? No, I don't think so. I'm looking forward to having my mom come in and we can tell you the rest of the story. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking about your story and giving us those details. I know that it's really difficult to do and I appreciate you being willing to be open and sharing those things. So thank you so much. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Elise, for having me on and for, uh, you know, just being able to see me in my struggle because you've been through a lot of the same things. 
Yeah, of course. I appreciate that. And guys, it really helps the algorithm and it helps our guests here. If you're able to leave some words of encouragement, our guests do read the comments and it means a lot to hear what you guys have to say. And if you want to support the podcast even further, we do have some merch at coastofconsciousness.com under the merch tab. You can come to Costa Rica with us. We're going next year for something a little bit more fun and less culty. <laughs> so that's in the description as well. You can become a patron at Patreon patreon.com slash cults to consciousness and if you like this video there will be two down here below that you're going to want to check out and until next time follow your highest excitement be conscious and be well <laughs>